tried to label him a progressive liberal, but at least for the time being, the epithets didn't stick. A few timid people who fear progress will try to give you new and strange names for what we are doing. Sometimes they will call it fascism, and sometimes communism, and sometimes regimentation, and sometimes socialism. But in so doing, they are trying to make very complex and theoretical, something that is really very simple and very practical. The thing that was so exciting in that first year of Roosevelt's administration was the large number of creative, imaginative people that were brought into the city. The most influential group was from Columbia University that had been assembled during the 1932 campaign. Known as the Brains Trust, they laid out the initial blueprint for the administrative assault on the Depression. Their role diminished after the election to be replaced not by the cabinet, but rather by a small cadre of advisors working directly for Roosevelt in the myriad of agencies that sprang out of the New Deal. During that first hundred days, all the new agencies that Roosevelt created, all the new programs, all the new policies, these were by and large not being administered or run by the traditional cabinet level departments. But there were individual cabinet members who did make a significant contribution. Men like Henry Morgenthau at Treasury, Harold Ickes at Interior, and Henry Wallace at Agriculture. But the star became the Labor Secretary, Frances Perkins, the first woman ever selected to serve in the cabinet. The best part of that early New Deal was the innovative aspects. Let's get after the problem. Let's try. Let's experiment. Even though we haven't had the experience, we aren't sure things will work. And, and out of that came, of course, tremendously dramatic things. Our troubles will not be over tomorrow. As the nation reeled under a succession of crises, the vast majority of Americans were developing a unique bond with this president. In the era before television, their image of Roosevelt was formed in large part by newsreels played to movie audiences every week before the main feature. Something fine has occurred in this great country. You can actually see people going to work. There's a new feeling of hope, of determination in the air. It is a new march of prosperity behind the country's militant leader, the fighting president. It was an uncritical portrait of the nation's chief executive, reflecting political goals rather than assessing presidential accomplishments. But his most significant dialogue with the American people came not in the nation's movie houses, but at individual homes as the country gathered around the fireside. There are those who fail to read both the signs of the time and American history. The public's image of FDR was shaped largely by his voice, reaching them through the emerging power of radio. The addresses appeared informal and conversational. That was deceptive. Each address required days of intense work, with the president taking the lead. They were broadcast on Sunday evenings at 9 o'clock, peak listening time. During the 12 years of his presidency, Roosevelt delivered 27 fireside chats, an average of two or three a year. His secretary, Grace Tully, later recalled the ritual that preceded each broadcast. And he always called it, I'll, I'll just think out loud. So I'd sit beside him on a couch in, this, in his study, and, uh, and he would think out loud, and I'd take it down. Sometimes thinking out loud went for about 10 pages, you know. <laughs> but this was something for the boys to put their teeth into, is the way he expressed it. So give, give it to the boys in the morning. When he got into the room to deliver the fireside chat, he would have people sitting there so he could pretend that he was talking to people in their living rooms, making his hand and his facial gestures as if he were talking live to an audience. And then he even noticed that there was a separation between his two front teeth and that it made a whistling sound sometimes, which he didn't like. So he had a removable bridge made just for his fireside chats. I am happy to speak to you from my home on a Sabbath day that has been observed in so many of your home communities as Brotherhood Day.
Here in Washington, for instance, nobody would go out or they'd invite somebody in, but they wouldn't go someplace where they didn't think that they were going to listen to the president. Now, even I think his enemies listened to him, uh, didn't like him, didn't agree with any, had, anything he had to say, criticized him all the time, but they wouldn't miss a speech. You could walk down the street on a hot Chicago night and not miss a single word of what he was saying on his fireside chat because you could just follow it from house to house to house. It was the first time Americans felt a personal connection with their president. But FDR ensured that it only went so far. The man that so touched the common people would be fiercely protective of his private self. There was a detachment to Franklin Roosevelt. Even those who were with him day after day wondered what he was really like. It was at his weekend retreats in Hyde Park where he could completely relax. Weekends off limits to the press. It was a time they would act up for the camera, show a side of the family the country would never be allowed to observe. These films, taken by Marion Dickerman, a friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, give us an unprecedented glimpse into the private world of the nation's 32nd president. There was the eternal optimism and good cheer, the playfulness that became infectious. Mighty good of you to come down here. I can't be truthful and say that I'm glad to get back. I'm awfully sorry to get back. <laughs> but uh, while I've been having a wonderful time, I gather also that both houses of Congress have been having a wonderful time. My earliest memories of my grandmother and grandfather, particularly of my grandfather, is his laughter and the times he was relaxing. And we would all go over to have a swim at Valkyll uh, and play in the pool. And uh, I was a little afraid, you know, three, four, five, six years old, because um, he... He, he dunked you. He loved to play games, and he liked to be silly. He could be silly. He enjoyed being silly. And we would go riding with him in the Ford, which he would steer uh, with, with, with the hand controls. Uh, he drove quite fast. Uh, in fact, my grandmother called him really a very poor driver. He had fun, and I remember his fun. Being with him was fun. And I could sense my mother was exhilarated and, and, and being part of that, that, uh, that whole scene. And people around, it was just full of laughter and, and gaiety and uh, um, a good time. But there was another side, a contrasting side, one that desired seclusion. For the man that projected congeniality and vigor, there were times when he would sit alone for hours with his stamp collection or playing a game of solitaire. Ever since Roosevelt was a young child, in order to protect himself from his overbearing mother, he had to hide his real feelings from her, and it then became almost a habit that the rest of his life he kept his true feelings inside. Probably the pain of polio made that even more important for him, not wanting anyone to know how deeply hurt he was at the loss of his body. And it became, unfortunately, a difficult situation for him to ever change. Presidents usually parade their triumphs over adversity. Roosevelt was the exception. His daily battle against the effects of paralysis was conducted in private. Few would know the toll it was taking but it was the one burden that never went away. Small things, like when he was going from the Oval Office back to the White House in his wheelchair, and he might be raising, you know, telling a story and waving his cigarette, etc. The other hand was folding, holding firmly onto the wheelchair, because if he didn't, he didn't have the buttocks muscles to hold himself on it. He could rock off. 
For over 10 years since the onset of polio, every hour of every day had been affected by this incapacity. To understand